Hello and welcome back to uh, Engineering 213, Strengths and Materials. And I wanted to uh, spend some time going over the uh, sample midterm examination. Uh, it's on the uh, website and if you don't know where the website is, I'll put a uh, link to it in this uh, video. Uh, but if you've uh, found that on the website, the, the, you'll see the uh, sample exam. You'll also see in a separate uh, PDF file the solutions to the sample exam and I really encourage you to print out the sample exam give yourself about an hour and a half uh, to try and uh, go through it and uh, see if you can get those before uh, looking at this video or looking at the solutions so assuming that you've already done that let's go ahead and go through these problems I think there's uh, 23 of them the, your uh, exam uh, it, itself the actual exam will probably be closer to about 15 but we just have uh, too many good problems to, to, to leave any out. So I'll go through these. Looking at uh, question number one, we've got this uh, T-shaped beam and we'd like to find the uh, centroid of it, uh, the distance above the uh, bottom edge. So we've taken this as our reference then and there is uh, some centroid for this thing, presumably somewhere about there, that we'd like to find where that is. You could cut this up a variety of different ways. You could take this as a tall vertical piece with these two side pieces. I think probably it's easier just to take two pieces, this uh, upper piece here, and then this piece here. And uh, again, as I go through this, it may be a little bit hard and a little bit blurry to read this, uh, but uh, like I said, there's an actual copy of this on the uh, website, and you can get that uh, uh, link for that in the description of the video. Well, we know that uh, the centroid Y bar, so if this is our uh, direction Y and this is uh, X, we could say that Y bar would be equal to the sum of all of the individual areas times all of their individual uh, centroids divided by the sum of all the individual areas. There we go. So let's see if we can uh, make that work out here. This uh, first piece, we've got uh, two inches so it looks like this is what eight inches this is uh, three inches this is three inches this is uh, two inches and this is two inches so we're gonna have a uh, two by eight and we're gonna multiply that by the distance to its centroid which would be half of this eight right so we could say that this is four and that of course comes from eight divided by two and then we're gonna have to add that we're gonna sum these things up um, this top portion is also two by eight right three and three is six and two is eight yep. two by eight and its centroid is located uh, up there which is going to be I think uh, nine and that of course comes from eight that gets me from there up to there and then half of two eight plus um, one half of two. Okay, that's where that comes from. So then I can divide by this area two by eight plus two by eight. And when you get done with that, you get 6.5 inches, which is answer A. So you could go ahead and, uh, you know, break it up like that if you wanted to and go back through the problem. You should get the same answer. Sometimes it's more work, sometimes it's less work. Um, but that's how you would get that one. Now the next one, we've got a uh, eye shape, and we would like to uh, find the area moment of inertia about the, uh, for this thing. So again, I put some the dimensions on here. This is what two and eight and uh, two and three and three and two. And this one you could cut up a variety of different ways. I'm going to choose to take it as this large piece here and then subtract out these two pieces right there. Okay, And the reason for that is that the centroids of all of these are on a line. If uh, you were to take it as a piece like this and a piece like this and a piece like this, that would be fine. You can do it. You could be good practice. But the centroids for these individual pieces <coughs> are not all on the same line and you're going to be using the parallel axes there are more to do that. 
So with this, I could say that I, uh, and th this is great practice for shapes that uh, maybe are like this, where you have a rectangle uh, with a, uh, a hole in it, and uh, you end up wanting to find the moment of inertia for that uh, piece there, then this technique of subtracting becomes very valuable. So let's, let's practice this. We know that I for a rectangle, what was I for a uh, re <coughs> excuse me, rectangle, is uh, base times height cubed divided by 12, right? So I've got uh, 8 times 12, is that right? Yep, 12 cubed divided by 12, and then I'm going to have to subtract, and there's two of these pieces. And what are they? They are 3 inches, and then 8 inches tall. cubed divided by 12. Double check my work here. Yep, I think we're good. Now if I were doing this um, just uh, on my own in consulting or something, I usually just uh, combine those and look at taking this out in one fell swoop and just say it's a piece that's six, but uh, mathematically of course that's the same. Well, when you go through the math here, you come up with 896 inches to the fourth, and that gives you answer B. So go ahead and, and, and try it like this. You'll have to use the parallel axis theorem to, to shift those. I think you'll find it's more difficult, but the important thing is, done correctly, you'll get the same answer. Well, let's move on then. Questions 3 and 4. We've got a uh, beam simply supported with a cantilever section at the right-hand side. This is what uh, 10 feet and uh, 10 feet and then uh, 1,000 pounds per foot. And it says, uh, what is the bending moment just to the right of B? What's this one down here? Just to the right of B. So again, um, if we take a section through here, I can draw that section right there. And luckily, because it's just to the right of B, I don't need to worry about the reaction at uh, B. Um, so I'll have something that looks like this. And I'm going to say that this is 10 feet. Now, a lot of people get worked up about that. Uh, you could say that that is 9.99999. You could continue that on. And... Uh, then you'd be to just to the right of, of B. Of course, that's going to round to 10, probably a little easier for calculations. Where we do need to put our effort, rather than fighting about 9.99 or 10, is to look at this uh, shear. i got to use the deformation sign convention. So looking at the right-hand side, the shear goes up, and the moment is going to go clockwise. And that's going to be important when, when I sort out whether we have a positive value or a negative value. So I could say maybe I'll tackle four first. What is the shear? Because this is shear and this is bending moment. So let me do the shear first. What's the shear just to the right of point B? Well, I could uh, sum the forces in the vertical direction, setting those equal to zero. And what do I have? I have V acting up minus this, uh, what? Up at this corner here, it's a 1,000 pounds per foot, isn't it? So I have minus... Um, What's the area of that? A thousand times ten, or nine point nine nine nine, divided by two, because it's a triangle. Anything else? I've taken care of that area there. I've taken care of that force. I think we are good. So this is ten thousand divided by two. So we could say that V is equal to. It's going to go to the other side, so it's positive five thousand pounds, or we could say five. Kips. Do we have one of those answers? There's five kips right there, and it is positive. Okay, so we know now that we effectively have five kips acting through there, and it acts actually through a distance of what distance would that be? 10 over 3 or 9.999 divided by 3, whatever your preference is there. So let's go up and tackle this one. If I sum the moment about the cut, setting that equal to zero, I'm going to have, I'll take a clockwise as positive. I'll say that I have m plus this 5 times a distance of 10 
over 3. So I've taken care of this uh, distributed load. I've taken care of that. I'm going through the cut. So I don't have to worry about this shear because really if I were to look at this uh, cut, this shear force goes right through it. I've just set it off for, for clarity's sake. So we would be multiplying this by zero. I mean, if you wanted to, you'd say V times zero. That's why I don't have to worry about that. So I can say then, uh, solving this equation here, that M is equal to minus uh, 50 over 3, which is going to be minus 16.67. Kip feet, right? Yeah, because this is kip, this is feet, so kip feet. So, do we have that answer? We might be tempted to look at that one, uh, but we carefully took care of our deformation sign convention. We've gone through this. Those are both clockwise, so this would have to be negative. So we'd really have to look at E. Like I've mentioned before, oftentimes we don't have many answers that are E. If I was forced to guess, I usually don't guess E. But in this case, um, because this is not negative, because this is positive, and we're looking for negative, E would be the correct answer. So go through that and practice that on your, your own. Well, let's look at the uh, next couple problems which deals with a uh, truss so let's see here we've got a, a thousand pounds and the truss here we've got our dimensions uh, given it's a, a truss so pin connection and we like to find the average axial stress in member AB so we need to know something about that member and we like to find the average axial stress in member A D. Okay, so that's what we're looking for. So if I uh, draw a free body diagram for the uh, truss itself, I'm going to at A have uh, AY and uh, AX, and then over here uh, I will have uh, C, and then I have this uh, 1000 acting down. This is uh, four feet here and four feet here. You could go ahead and do a uh, moment about, let's say that we sum the moments about C, setting that equal to zero. Um, AX intersects, C, C intersects, so I would have uh, AY times eight minus a thousand times four. So what does uh, solving this then, solving this equation, AY is equal to, that goes to the other side, so it's positive, AY is 1,000 times 4 divided by 8, which gives me 500, 500 pounds. And a lot of you would probably just recognize, I mean, summing the forces in the horizontal, this goes to zero. And then this is a symmetrical problem, so it should not surprise us that both AY and C would be 500 pounds. You could demonstrate that to yourself, some of the forces in the vertical direction, setting those equal to C, and conclude that C is also 500 pounds. So there's nothing wrong with going through that. Um, but if you recognize the symmetry in this problem, uh, you can jump to this pretty fast. Now, now what do we do with that? <clears throat> well, what I think I'm going to do then is I'm going to do a method of joints at A. So at A now, and that's why we had to get this reaction. We had to get it right. I'm going to take that I have assumed that I've got compression here, which is a fairly safe assumption in a lot of cases. So I'll take uh, AB like that, and I'm going to assume that I have tension here, AD like that. Of course, I've got to put the uh, reaction that we found, 500 pounds up there. AX was zero, so I won't even worry about putting that on. Now this is, uh, we've got a triangle that is uh, three here and four here. So that angle is going to be the arc tangent of opposite that 3 over 4 which gives me what 36.87 or you could actually just use it as the ratios uh, but uh, most a lot of people are a little more comfortable with the angle so 
37 degrees or call it 37 degrees but so with that I think if I um, sum the forces in the vertical direction setting it equal to zero what do I have I have 500 minus AB times the sine of 36.87 right so that gives me AB I can solve for that directly is 833 pounds it's a positive number so I know it's in compression um, then I get to uh, sum the uh, forces in the horizontal setting that equal to zero what do I have well that's not horizontal so all I have is a D minus a B times the cosine of 36.87 so we'll put that into there and then a D turns out to be equal to 667 pounds we drew that in tension it was a positive number so it is in tension so that, that's why um, of course st uh, statics is a uh, of course why uh, statics is a prerequisite for this class this is really just a review of statics here and hopefully a good review of statics now that we have these numbers, what's the average axial stress in AB? Well, we know this is 833 pounds in compression. And what's the average axial stress in AD? 667 pounds in tension. That's the force, not the stress. So we know with the uh, stress, we've been using these equations that uh, stress is equal to force over area, right? So did they tell us the area? Each member has a 1.5 by 3.5. So I should be able to, to get that, right? So I take this thing. Sigma here is going to be equal to a minus, because of compression, eight, oops, 833. 8. 33 divided by the area which is uh, 1.5 times 3.5 and see if I can put this in here Sigma here is going to be a positive because it's tension positive 667 divided by they said everything was the same area which is usually not that common but uh, uh, for no, it's you know sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, but uh, it is in this problem. So 1.5 times 3.5. So this turns out to be positive 127 pounds per inch squared psi, and this turns out to be minus 159 psi. So I have minus 159, answer C there, positive 127, answer C there. So I guess guessing C in that case um, would have saved you, but it's better to just plain know the problem. So you could go ahead and uh, go through this. You could uh, explore the, uh, the stress in the uh, other pieces if you wanted to. It's symmetrical, so you'd expect these to be the same. It'd be kind of interesting to see what you get in that one. Anyway, I think we can uh, move on then. Next problem looks uh, at first glance to be uh, statically indeterminate, right? Looks like uh, we're told assume A and B have the same Young's modulus, the same E, and are rigidly attached. They've got this stuck there really well and stuck here really well. And we're applying uh, P to this. If we were to look at a, a quick uh, free body diagram of this thing, obviously this is stuck up here, so there's going to be some uh, reaction there. And then we've applied these loads here, and we'd have some reaction here. And we could uh, sum the forces in the vertical, setting that equal to zero. I have one, <coughs> excuse me again, I have one equation. But I have two unknowns. I have this unknown and I have that unknown. 
If I try and sum the forces in the horizontal, it's a trivial equation. Everything's in a straight line, so the moment uh, goes to zero. It's so trivial. Uh, so I'm, again, left with one equation, and I have two unknowns, so statically indeterminate. So the way I do the statically indeterminate is I'm going to draw the released structure. where I, I cut through this, I melt the glue away, I take the glue away, whatever, I, I detach it from there. And we're still going to then have this force apply, applied there. We've got uh, P there and P there. That's the release structure, and you can't just uh, go cutting things off, so we would have to look at, in addition to that, what happens if you put what we removed back on there. So we'll put this uh, R1 on like that. I think this is what uh, A, and this is B, A, and B. Now this one, it's important to, to notice that this is really the the, de the deflection up here. If we talk about, uh, I think when you, you imagine if you cut this away here, it's going to slump down. You're going to have some deflection here. Let's say delta 1. And we could say that delta 1 is really just a function of B, isn't it? Whatever is going on in B. Okay, not that B is a single variable, but whatever is happening in B, the deflection is only a function of that. This A is just going along for a ride. Everything that is happening is happening down in there. Okay, whereas you could imagine that uh, this is going to stretch out. You're going to have some deflection here. We'll call that delta 2. And delta 2 is going to be a function of A and B, right? This is going to stretch a little bit, and this is going to stretch a little bit, so the deflection is the, the whole thing there. We're going to have to add those pieces together. So if we do that, we could say that uh, delta 1 is equal to, let's see, we have 2 times the force, so there's 2P times L, L right there, divided by the area of the B cross-section times E. This one Delta 2 is going to be equal to, what are we going to have here, um, R1 times L over the area of A times E, so that's that piece, plus I have to add to it R1, because they'll both have the same force in them, R1 times L because the length here is L, the length there is L, divided by the area of B plus E. And we might say E for B, but we're told they all have the same Young's modulus. So then we can put these things together, that delta 1 is equal to delta 2, and when I set those equal together to, equal to each other, I have 2P times L over ABE equals then we're going to, uh, let's see, factor out an R1. We'd have L over AAE plus L over ABE. And they say that E is all the same, so I can cancel that out. And obviously L is the same, so I can drop out an L. So I can say that um, 2... P divided by A sub B is equal to R1 times 1 over the area of A plus 1 over the area of B. Now I'm running out of room here. Let me grab another piece of paper. catch up on my numbering. This was, I believe, 3. So this is 4. And this will be 
five. So let's see, I'm, I'm really trying to solve for what? I'd like to find R1, wouldn't I? So I could say that uh, R1 is equal to 2 times P divided by the area of B. I take this whole thing and divide it by 1 over the area of A plus 1 over the area of B. So what's that look like? We're given that uh, P, I believe, was 10,000. So 2 times that is 20,000. Divided by the area of, let's see, A is a uh, 3 quarter inch diameter solid steel shaft, and B is an inch and a half solid steel. So I'm going to have a pi over 4 times 1.5 squared. I'm using, of course, that the area for a circle is pi d squared over 4. And I have to divide this whole thing by uh, 1 divided by the area of A is, let's see, well, make sure I've done this right, B. B has a diameter 1.5, right? Yes. And A has a diameter of 3 quarter. Yes. So when I get back over here, I need the area of B, so I'd better be using the diameter of B, which is 1.5. Good. Now the area of A, that is 3 quarters, so I will do pi over 4 times 0.75 squared, plus then the area of B, that will be a repeat of that, pi over 4 times 1.5 squared. So when the smoke clears from this, you find that R is equal to... 4,000 pounds. Okay. If you look at the uh, uh, units on this, this is area. This is going to be area. So you're left with the same units as P. You'd have pounds then. So with 4,000 pounds, we should be able to go back and answer these questions. What is the average axial stress in section A? Well, we know that the uh, force in A is simply this R1, isn't it? The force in A here is R1. So we could say that sigma for A is going to be equal to 4,000 divided by the area. What's that? Pi over 4 times 0.75 squared. So 9,054 PSI. Is that answer there? So, 9,054 PSI. That's about what? 54 doesn't mean a lot at 9,000, so we'd say it's about 9 KSI. Do we have that one? Yeah, there we go. So we'll answer B there. Then uh, sigma B is equal to... What are we going to have here? Well, if we come over here and go through this forces in the vertical, we know that R2 is going to have to be equal to 20,000 minus 4,000, because that was um, this. So we'd have, what, 16,000? Okay, so what's the internal force in section B? No, they're not even asking for stress. They're asking us for force, aren't they? Well, we've got that. 16,000. Answer C. So, good. So you've got some statically indeterminate homework problems. You can go back through this problem, practice with this. This uh, signal B was not required. Because really all we needed was the force in B. We got that right there.
Good. So now questions 9 through 14 are going to uh, go pretty quick. See if we can get through those. Using the following information, a rod of 2 foot length. So it's uh, 2 feet in length and half inch diameter. It is subject to an axial tension. So we're pulling on this thing to the tune of 5,500 pounds. With a load applied, the length increases to, so it goes from uh, 2 feet to, or 24 inches, to 24.0176. So that's how far it stretches. And then, you, as you uh, imagine, if, if I were to exaggerate this, it gets smaller in uh, cross-section and it gets longer in length, right? And they're told that it, that's how much it got longer in length and that's how much it got smaller in cross-section. So we should be able to do this. Uh, nine, what's the average axial stress? Should be pretty easy, right? We could say that that is force over area. So we've got sigma, which is force over area. 5,500 pounds divided by the area. We'll go ahead and use the original area since we're looking at uh, this in terms of in engineering terms. So I've got pi over 4 times 0.5 squared inches squared, which turns out to be about 28 KSI. So answer C. What's the average lateral stress? A lot of times students uh, get stymied at this. Well, go back and use your equation. Sigma is equal to force over area. What's the force in the lateral direction? Well, I see this in the axial direction. I don't see any in the lateral. Good. So zero divided by A must be zero. Okay. What's the axial strain? Okay. Well, the axial strain, we've got uh, strain by definition is delta over L. Okay, so how much longer did it get? Well, the 0 0.0176, 0 0.0176 divided by, and we're using engineering strain, so we just use the original 24. If this is inches, this had better be inches. This turns out to be 0 0.733 times 10 to the minus 3. Typically, these are very small numbers. Looks like we have answer B here. Then what is the lateral strain? Well, a lot of times people come over here and say, well, this is zero, this must be zero. No, not at all. Because of uh, Poisson's ratio and whatnot, this, this could well be non-zero. So let's go through this. We could say that uh, epsilon lateral, this is axial, this is lateral, would just be the change in the diameter divided by the original diameter. So what do we have? Uh, 5 minus a uh, point 0.4, sorry, it's point 0.5 minus point 0.4999, and that's getting shorter, so that should be negative, divided by the original point 0.5, which turns out to be what? Minus 0 0.2 times 10 to the minus 3. Okay, do we have that right there? Answer C. Probably not so many C's on the actual exam, but it doesn't really matter on a test like that, on the practice test. But anyway, well, let's see. Young's modulus. Well, we know that, um, of course, this was negative because it, it got uh, smaller in cross section, smaller in diameter. But we know from uh, Hooke's law that the stress is equal to the um, Young's modulus, and so modulus elasticity, times the strain E. So we could say that E then is going to be equal to the stress divided by the strain. And I'm going to use the axial. So I'm going to use uh, 28 times 10 to the 3. That's this one. And do I have axial strain? Yep, right down here. That's that one. 0.7. 3, 3 
times 10 to the minus 3. Could I have used the lateral? No, that gets to be problematic because of, of that. So if we uh, use this then we have 38.2 times 10 to the 6. That seems in the ballpark for steel, right? That doesn't seem uh, that unreasonable. That would be PSI. Do we have that answer? Yeah. And if someone gives you um, changes this to KSI, you just uh, change the numbers there, right? Be 10 to the 3 KSI. So we will pick answer D there. Now Poisson's ratio for the material, we'll go back to our definitions. Poisson's ratio uh, is equal to minus epsilon lateral over epsilon axial. Do we have those? I hope. Yeah, right there. So I have a minus, this is negative, so I've got a minus, minus 0 0.2 times 10 to the minus 3. And do we have the uh, axial? Yep. 0.733 times 10 to the minus 3. Of course, the uh, negatives cancel out on that. And you come up with 0 0.273, which Poisson's ratio is, usually hovers around 0 0.3. So I think we are, are good with that. And I mean, if you're in a hurry on this test, you, you could take a, a gamble and say, well, I bet this is probably around 0.3, and you'd uh, recognize the right answer without even doing work on that. So uh, six questions, six important questions, and really the key to them is just writing the equation and filling in the terms. So it's a, a, a good problem to go through. We'll continue on. So we've got this problem, looks like a torsional problem. So we've got uh, 500 pound-feet of torque, uh, 1.5 length, and it's a hollow shaft. Okay, so let's see. The polar moment of inertia for a solid shaft is what? Um, pi over 2 times r to the fourth, or you could say that it was pi times d to the fourth over 32. So that allows me to say that uh, the polar moment of inertia, and sometimes this is j, okay, sometimes I use j, for a hollow shaft is going to be what? Pi over 32 if I use the diameter, and then I just say that it's OD to the fourth minus ID to the fourth. I can just subtract the uh, inner. So if I go through this for our problem, we have pi over 32 times what? An inch uh, OD 1 to the fourth minus 0.75 to the fourth. So this turns out to be 0 0.0671 inches to the fourth. Now the other thing is I suspect that we're going to need uh, g on this problem. And they didn't give us g. But we know from our, our work that uh, we can calculate g. The shear modulus elasticity g is equal to Young's modulus, or the modulus elasticity e, divided by 2 times the quantity 1 plus Poisson's ratio. So that was some uh, work that we uh, did in class. Fairly well established. So let's see if we can do this. We've got uh, E. So 30 times 10 to the 6 looks like steel. Divided by 2 times 1 plus uh, Poisson's ratio 0.3. That should not surprise us. So that's where the 1.3 comes from. You go through the math here. 11.5 five three eight too many figures there but anyway ten to the sixth psi so i've got uh, this piece and i've got this piece hopefully i can use that to uh, to solve this so we'd like to calculate the value of the maximum shear stress well we know that uh, the shear stress tau is equal to the torque times r divided by the polar moment of inertia and to get the maximum, we just use the maximum r. So that's just going to be half of the outside diameter. So let's do that. So I've got uh, 500 
Now this is going to be pound feet, and I think everything's in inches, so I th think we'll probably want to multiply this by 12 so I can get pound inches times then r for the maximum. I'm going to use a half of an inch because that would be at the extreme outside. If we look at that hollow shaft, that would be at the outside that uh, r is equal to a half of an inch. So I've got a half divided by polar moment of inertia 0 0.0671 inches to the fourth. So I get to cancel this and this with two of those and that leaves me with pounds per inch squared, which is good news. That's the units that I'm, I'm looking for. And it's very important I carefully deal with the units because that's where that 12 came from. If I had pound feet in there, I'd have a mess for the units. We run through the uh, numbers on this. This turns out to be um, 44.7 times 10 to the 3 pounds per inch squared. So I could just say it was 44.7 KSI, right? Dividing by 1,000 to go to KSI, we get that answer right there. Calculate the angular deflection of the free end where the torque is applied. So it's going to twist, isn't it? We know that the governing equation for that phi is equal to the torque T times the length divided by the polar, uh, excuse me, G, which is the shear modulus of elasticity times the polar moment of inertia. Sometimes, again, they rec uh, note that as J. So what are we going to have here? 500 times 12 times the length is 1.5, so that'll be 18 inches, won't it? And then G is 11.538 times 10 to the 6. And uh, polar moment of inertia, 0 0.0671. That turns out to be 0 0.1 three nine five and that would be radians you convert that to degrees seven point nine nine degrees so about eight degrees looks like answer C before we rest with that we probably should uh, look at the units on this thing looking at the uh, units on there what do we have well we've multiplied this 500 pound feet by 12 so I have pound inches I have 18 in terms of inches so again, you'd, you'd want to be really careful. If you had this in pound feet and you had this in feet, you'd be off by a factor of 144. So be real careful with the units on this. This is then pounds per inch squared, PSI, and 0.67 is inches to the fourth. So I get to cancel that with two of those. And then two more of those with those, and pounds with pounds. And sure enough, we're left with nothing or, or radians. Good. Okay. Well, as we continue on then. So we have a, a beam problem. We're given the uh, moment diagram. We should uh, use that. We've got the uh, cross-sectional properties. We have a uh, y here, and that's a uh, positive y. We have a y here. That's a minus y. That should uh, trigger something. Uh, we're thinking about this might be a trick problem or a tricky problem. So we're asked, what is the maximum compressive stress in the beam due to bending? Well, we're going to use the equation. Uh, sigma is equal to minus m y divided by i, right? So there's a couple places that we could uh, look in this. We might be tempted to look right here. Okay, that's the maximum number, 2800. Only thing that's uh, close is 2000. We'll get there in a moment. So what I'm going to do on this is I'm going to look at look at the top of the beam with uh, x equal to 8 feet. Okay, So I'm looking right here and I'm looking at the top of the beam. So my equation is going to be sigma is equal to minus and I'll have 2800 right there, 2800 times y, what's y? 
2.32 because I'm looking at the top of the beam. This is my the, the centroid of this thing. So I gotta go to the top of the beam, 2.32. And then I'm dividing this by I. We were given I here, so don't go calculating that. That's given to us 44.55. And uh, if I look at the units on this, I've got, what, inches to the fourth here. I have inches here. And then this is going to be in pound feet. So I'd better multiply this thing by 12 inches and a foot, right? So when you do that, you know, the, the negative signs retain. So you have minus. So 2,800, 2.32, minus 1,750. You go through the unit analysis, taking into account that 12, because that's for units. You're going to have PSI. Because I, I couldn't have this pound feet. I wanted pound inches, so that's why I had that uh, 12 there. And we might be tempted to say that that's the answer. Um, but we did an example like this in lecture. It's not a symmetrical section, so I bet we need to explore this a little bit. So let's look at the uh, bottom with x equal 0. So I'm looking right here. Okay, I'm looking at the bottom right there at this value. So I could say that sigma is equal to minus. I've got minus 2,000 from right there times now y is going to be a 3.68. Okay. Uh, yes, 3.68. And because it's down, I mean, this is positive y, that's negative y. I mean, this is, this is taken as our reference. So this is uh, negative numbers. This is positive numbers. So I'm going to have a minus 3.68. Still have that 12 in there for the units. Still dividing by I, 44.55. I have a negative, a negative, and a negative, so I retain a negative answer. And as you go through the math here, while this number is smaller, this number is significantly larger, and we come up with minus 1982 PSI. So that's the answer, answer C. So not that one. Be tempting to do that, but it's actually this one. Now, if the section is symmetric, like in an I beam or box beam or something like that, then it's it's pretty easy. Uh, but when this Y distance changes, sometimes you have to look at a couple different cases. Uh, what is the shear in the beam just above the AA section? So we're looking just above there, right? Okay. Well. With uh, shear, we know that uh, shear tau is equal to VQ divided by IB, right? So I could say that this was, what is the shear stress in the beam just above a, at x equals 2 feet? There's x equals 2 feet. So what's my shear? 800. So I'm taking x equals 2 feet, 800. That's how I got that. So I have 800 pounds times Q. Let's see, what's Q going to be? Well, I have to take the area beyond that, which is this little area right there. So I'm going to be taking what that's a 1 by 2. And then I need to deal with the distance from the neutral axis to the centroid of that area, right? Which is going to be, if I were to go from the neutral axis to the outside edge, 3.68. But I don't need to go to the outside edge. I have to go to the centroid of that piece, which is going to be halfway, half of 1. So that's 1 inch divided by 2. That's where that came from. So this whole thing here is the Q that's in inches cubed. I'm going to divide this then by I, 44.55 inches to the fourth. And B, since we are just above AA, AA is at this interface here, 
it looks like it is one inch. Okay. So our unit should work out. We should come up with 114.2 psi. Is that right? We'd have inches to the fifth, inches cubed, so inches squared remain in the bottom, pounds per inches squared. Yep. So our units work out. You had uh, several homework problems, uh, and we talked several times in lecture about calculating this uh, Q, the area beyond where you're trying to find the, the uh, shear times the distance from the neutral axis to centroid of that area. If we were trying to find Q right here, we'd be looking at this area, and then we'd have to take the distance to the centroid of that area. So, good, I think we've got that. Okay, so we've got a uh, problem here, A37, A307 pin, that's the standard pin in there. Um, we're assuming that the one inch diameter pin, one inch diameter hole, so our, our uh, the tolerancing experts may not like that, but that'll keep the uh, problem easy. We're asked, what's the maximum load that can be supported if the maximum allowable shear stress in the pin is 15 KSI? Assume the plate does not fail. Well, this problem, we are in um, double shear, aren't we? I mean, for this to fail, we would have to fail through there and through there, wouldn't it? So we have double shear. So I could say that the shear stress tau is equal to the force divided by two times the area because it's in double shear. And I could rearrange this equation that the force would be equal to two times the area times the allowable shear tau. tau. So I've got then two times the area, which would be uh, pi over four times, we got a one inch diameter, so one squared. Be really careful with the area of a circle. So many times people mess that up on these problems. They do the tough stuff right, and then that little detail they mess up, and it really throws your answer off and uh, can have devastating results. So be careful with that. I've got uh, uh, pi diameter squared divided by four, so I think we're okay with that. This is then going to be inches squared. We multiply this by tau 15,000. Uh, pounds per inch squared, and I get to cancel that with that, and we get a unit of, of pounds. So when the uh, smoke clears on that, we've got 23.6 um, times 10 to the 3 pounds. So what's that? 23.6 kip. Looks like answer A. What's the maximum load can be supported if the maximum allowable tension stress in the plate is 25 KSI? Assume the pin does not fail. Well, the, pin, the plate is most likely going to fail at the pin, right? So if we look at this, going to fail through there and there, right? So if we look at uh, sigma being equal to force divided by area, I could say then that um, the maximum force P would be equal to sigma times the area, which is 25,000 pounds per inch squared times the area. Let's see, what area am I going to have? I've got a half inch thick plate, so there's the half. And I'm multiplying that by this, which is 3 inches less the one inch diameter. That'll be inches squared, so I get to cancel that with that. Okay. So if I were if I were to take a cross section through here, I am looking at there's where the hole is. I'm just looking at that. Because this is a one inch diameter. This is three inches. So that's where that came from. And of course this is the half. 
So you run through the math on that, and that turns out to be 25 times 10 to the 3 pounds, or 25 kips. Answer C. Now the one uh, big thing is we have ignored stress concentration. You would expect the uh, stress concentration to be a lot greater around this hole, a pin, a pin loaded hole. We talked about um, that in lecture. If, if you were asked to, to account for stress concentration, you'd be given a, a, a table for that or a graph for that that you could go into. But uh, um, we are, of course, assuming no stress concentration on this one. So I'm 25 kips. Good. Double check this. Okay. So getting close to wrapping this up here. We had a problem here. We've got a uh, the uh, wood beam sticking a wood cantilevered beam. You've got this load that is uh, 7,500 pounds. We've got the washer. We're assuming that we've got this three-quarter inch rod and we've got a three-quarter inch hole in the wood, which usually doesn't work that well. But again, uh, don't want to get carried away with tolerancing. Um, so just, just want to keep this easy. So uh, certainly um, this is probably not exactly how we build it, but it keeps the numbers easy for this in terms of not having a, a lot of uh, odd dimensions. Well, we've got uh, what is the bearing stress between the washer and the wood? So we're looking at this interface right up there. Again, our bearing stress, we could say sigma sub bearing is force divided by area. And it's always force over area, isn't it? So the big question is what force and what area? Well, we've got 7,500 pounds here. And the area, the area is going to look like um, the area of the washer, isn't it? And we're going to look at that area right there. So I think we will have um, the area of the outside, the area of the large one, minus the area of the small circle. So I'm going to say that that's a pi over 4 times the outside diameter squared minus the inside diameter squared, right? So this looks like a, a good sized uh, washer that they might use in wood construction. People go into wood construction and talk about the kind of hardware and whatnot. But anyway, pi divided by 4 times the OD, which is 3.5 squared, minus the ID, which is 3 quarters. And again, if it's a 3 quarter rod, that would be probably not be 3 quarters, but we'll keep this easy and say 3 quarters. So this is inches squared, so we'll have PSI. So this turns out to be 8. 17 PSI. Do we have that? Yep. Answer C. Definitely not this many answer C's on the actual exam. Don't, don't say, oh, I don't need to study. I'm just going to answer C on everything. So, Let's see. What's the tensile stress in the rod? Another thing, we're, we're assuming that the threads don't reduce the strength of the rod. Uh, usually when you have threads, you have to look at that root diameter for the thread, not the gross diameter for the, uh, the rod. So again, we're keeping this very, very simple. We should be able then to say that what we have uh, sigma is equal to force over area, right? What force do we have? 7,500 pounds. That's what's in this rod if you were to cut through there. And the area. Well, it's the area of the rod. Looks like that, doesn't it? Pi over 4 times 0.75 squared, inches squared. So we come up with 16 um, point, is that right? 16.97 KSI. I moved my decimal because I've, I've got this K in here times 10 to the 3, right? So I've got about 17. Good. I've got about uh, 17 KSI. So again, we use this over and over, but the trick is to figure out what's the force and what is the area.
with a uh, last question. Find the total deflection a two inch long, three quarter inch diameter steel uh, rod would have, and there's our properties for the steel, if it had a 5,000 pound tension load placed on it. Okay, so maybe we've got this uh, rod hanging from the uh, ceiling. And we apply, what are we applying to this thing? 5,000 pounds. So with the tension, it's going to get uh, longer, right? And we know that uh, the deflection, this is for the load, is equal to our favorite equation there, PL over AE. We should all remember that, derived from Hooke's Law. So we have uh, 5,000 times the length, which is, what, 24 inches, divided by A, which is 3 quarter inch diameter, so pi over 4 times 0.75 squared times E, which is 30 times 10 to the 6 PSI. You can double check the units on that, but it should come out as inches. In fact, is 0 0.0091 inches. And it's getting, we know this is tension, so it's getting longer. That's going to be important. And what else is muddying the problem up? At the same time, it's cooled 100 degrees Fahrenheit. That's why we had this alpha up here. So if we look at the uh, cooling on this, the uh, temperature, um, change due to temperature, delta is going to be equal to alpha times L times delta T, right? So I have a 7 times 10 to the 6, uh, 1 over degrees Fahrenheit. It would be the same as 1 over degrees Rankine. The, the delta temperature is the same. Certainly not to be confused with uh, 1 over degrees centigrade or, or 1 over Kelvin. So we've got uh, 7 times 10 to the 6 times the original length, which is 24 inches, times our temperature. It's getting cooler, so we're going to subtract off. We're dropping the temperature, hence the negative 100 degrees, 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So this turns out to be minus 0 0.0168 inches. This is getting shorter because of temperature, which when we cool it, we would expect that it, we would expect it to contract. We talked about that in class. So what are we going to do? We're going to add these together. I take this positive number and add it to that negative number, and I'm still left with a negative number, 0 0.0077. So the overall is it still got shorter. Even though we put a load on it, it got shorter because of the temperature effect and the relatively small load for that large of a rod. So do we have that answer? Um, yeah. Again, answer C, which seems like a, a good way to uh, finish up this test. Well, like I mentioned at the uh, beginning, download the, uh, hopefully you've done this already, but if you haven't, download the sample exam, sit down with it um, without the solutions, and see if you can uh, you can get through this. I think that will uh, definitely uh, be, be worth your time. And when you come to a problem that you can work multiple ways, try it two or three uh, different ways. So hopefully this has been a, a help, um, and uh, good luck on the examination, and I will uh, see you next time. Thank you for watching.